Okay. All right. A very, very good afternoon to all our dear students, our final year students of IIHM. Uh, India, Pan-India, and we are very, very happy to have today amongst us uh, Mr. Ajit Matthew. Uh, Mr. Ajit Matthew happens to be a human resource professional, and he specializes in cruise liner services, and he has been basically living out of India. He's, in fact, uh, based out of Miami uh, and definitely currently at home. During the lockdown, he is at home at Cochin. And, you know, we are very, very honored to have him here today. And definitely it will be giving us a great introspect on a very important vertical of hospitality, which is cruise liner services. So a very, very big welcome to you, Mr. Matthew, from the IIHM team. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Sanchari. Yes. And, and, uh, yes, yes, Mr. Matthew. No, it's always a pleasure to, to speak to uh, students and, and colleges to, uh, you know, share some good knowledge about the cruise industry. That's right. So today, while we are, in fact, getting into the entire macro part of cruise liners and how does a career looks like, and I'm certain all our students are very, very keen and interested to know about, you know, the entire vertical of cruise liners, we would like to begin uh, today with your journey. Okay, my... My journey with uh, cruise lines is, uh, is very interesting because I started first with cruise lines uh, back in 2002, uh, 2003 uh, as a bartender. Okay, I went on the ship, I uh, worked there for a year, and then I decided, no, this is not for me, and I quit. And then I came back. Uh, I started working uh, with Taj at that point of time. But then once I, I, I moved back to uh, HR, I did my MBA and I moved into HR, uh, and I was a uh, training manager for the Radisson Blue, uh, which is in Cochin now. Uh, I got a call from one of uh, the training managers uh, who worked on ships and asked me, hey, you've uh, been on ships before. Are you interested to come back to ships? And I was like, okay, let me give it a shot and see how it goes. So then I went in 2010 uh, and joined Norwegian Cruise Lines. Uh, that is based out of New York. Uh, and we had a great... Uh, three years working with Norwegian cruise lines and different ships of the air company. And then I got promoted and I moved to Royal Caribbean uh, and worked with them as leadership consultant, working with the executives on board, uh, being a leadership coach for them. And then uh, from there I got promoted and I moved into human resources uh, with the same Royal Caribbean International. Uh, it's one of the biggest world uh, cruising companies. And uh, finally, uh, we also have uh, uh, the, the position when they opened with human resources, I decided to uh, you know take it a little bit further and then they offered me to uh, go on the Oasis class of ships, which is the world's biggest cruise line, uh, which is a ship which can take up to 8,000 people at the same time. And so I was like, okay, let me get that. And then now I have a team there who I work with. Uh, and uh, we I cruise uh, every four months and then two months I get uh, vacation and I'm, I'm at home uh, enjoying the family. But then uh, four months, then it's a uh, rigorous work uh, at uh, those ships. At, you know, a ship like that is not easy to uh, to enjoy, but uh, we do find our time to have fun as well. So that's my small little journey. Uh, it's taken 20 years to be where I am right now, but uh, I've enjoyed every bit of it. I've uh, seen, like you said, it's a vertical of hospitality. So it, uh, it becomes easy for us who are hospitality uh, background to easily connect with the cruise line uh, because uh, you know, we know what it takes to be uh, running a hospitality industry. So when you're working in a hotel, if you've done, uh, you know, you've, you've done your background in any hotel management college, you would be able to easily relate yourself to how a ship works. But yes, it's got its own differences, but uh, absolutely that difference is understood by uh, people who come and, you know, start working you know, for a couple of months and they are uh, in a spot at that time. So uh, yeah, so that's uh, basically what my journey has been. Uh, talking about uh, cruise industry, uh, you know, I spoke to you earlier also, this, the mm -hmm. cruising culture is not very common in India, right? Right, yes. If you think of, a, let's take Sanchari, if you think of a vacation, the first thing might come into your mind is, oh, let me go to Paris, or let me go to, uh, you know, Singapore, or let me go to, you know, you might think of, uh, let me go and see Taj Mahal, I'm just saying. That's uh, right, yes. The sea or uh, the ships never come to your mind at all, mm -hmm. because the culture of cruising is not very common in India. Uh, one, because it's, uh, we don't have ships which are sailing out. The first one ship which has started right now, but 
Apart from that, there are no ships which sail out of India. So nobody's aware about it. Second is it's very expensive because now you need to fly to United States or you need to fly to Europe right. or you need to fly to uh, what we call uh, Singapore uh, to get a, into a cruise. So now you end up spending more money on just traveling and getting to that destination. And then you spend the money on the cruise as well. So uh, it's not a very common culture. Again, in hospitality, like you said, not much is spoken about it in colleges or uh, students or, or employees because they never go for an industrial training on a ship. So right. nobody knows what it takes to yes. be there. So uh, the second one, nobody goes in and checks it out for three months and say, oh, okay, let me, let me check it out. And that doesn't work. You, you have to go all out there and, and perform a full job to get on ship. So it takes a little time for people to understand what it takes. So uh, I thought, you know what, I'm sitting here and uh, rather ensure that, you know, I spread the awareness among people about what it is taking to be on a cruise ship. Okay. So I thought, you know what, let me uh, catch up with IHM. It's, it's, uh, I spoke to IHM today as well. Right. Uh, with IHM and Trivandrum. I had a session with them. Uh, and then I thought, you know what, let me reach out to a few more colleges and see if it works out. And thanks to you and your team, they were very happy to, to get this uh, session going. Indeed. Uh, Ajit, in fact, I'm calling you by your first name. So Yes, absolutely. Please. There's nothing else yes. works. Uh, yes. I'm not used to this whole culture of sir. A couple of times somebody That's called right. me sir. I'm like, we never use that term. That, absolutely. That yes. First name is the culture that we use. That's in, right. In the That's national right. Way. That's right. Thank you. So Ajit, I have a question, uh, you know, when you basically went ahead and started your career, you know, and of course you're dealing with HR, you're dealing with human resources, you're basically educating people and definitely giving them award the cruise liner services. So uh, uh, any student who is a hospitality management student, you know, what are the prerequisites that he or she needs to have in order to go ahead and start a career? Can that be directly after the management is over or he or she needs to basically have a hotel working experience before. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's, see, the, the reason why uh, it becomes a little challenging is uh, you, you need to understand how a ship works, right? Right. Uh, there is, a, a ship has a certain amount of space. Space is the greatest concern, okay? Uh, it's a constraint in the end of the day. There is an Air Force size paper and you mm -hmm. can't do anything out of it. You can't add an extension on the side and you can't. That's what is in there. So mm -hmm. what happens is every inch of space is, is valued for. So there is a certain amount of people when it comes to uh, crew and guests that a ship can carry. So when we have a certain amount of crew as such, uh, every single position is valuable for the company. And that's why they are put in that role to perform a job on the ship. So what happens is that as an employee comes and works, we do not have opportunity to train people for the job. Okay, there is no training opportunity there because the moment you step on the ship, you have taken over the role of somebody who just gone on vacation, mm. right? And that person is a super uh, expert in the job that he's been doing for the last three, four, six months or eight months, you know? So mm -hmm. you come in and your expectation from day one, the moment you step in is to wear the uniform and go to work, Okay. So if you are just passed from college, you've just passed your management and you've come into place, there is no way that you can get into that job right away and know the A to Z about the job. I'm talking about technical skills. Experience, mm -hmm. yes. Ships are different from hotels in, in a lot of ways. Uh, but again, the base is the same. And that technical base is what we expect people to know before they come on the ship. Because there is a lot of things that you need to adapt to before you get on a ship. Uh, one, number one definitely is uh, safety and security because safety on a ship is priority number one. And we, we, once you come on a ship, spend the first two months training you about how to deal with safety issues. And that's part of the, that of part of the training, but that's only one hour uh, or three hours in a week, et cetera, that happens. So that's happening in one side. On the other side is you are adapting with the whole job culture that is there because uh, you know, it's not the same as working on land. The equipment that you use is different. Uh, the kind of uh, things that uh, are the, what are the products that we use are very different from what is used on land. So you're getting used mm -hmm. to that. And then on mm -hmm. top of all this, you're getting used to the international culture. People who you work with, they are not people who speak a common language. The only common language you uh, speak is English. If not, uh, you if you're joining a German company, 
company, then you need to know them and that's why they will hire you. And that's why you can speak to people around you in that one common language. So from language to cultures, to, to religion, to ways of living, everybody's different. So you, you need to adapt to that. So overall, apart from your job, there's so much things that you need to learn within the first three months. So we have seen that people who have very little experience doing the basics about their job, if they come on board, they, we are planning to have them fail. Mm -hmm. And that is not acceptable for us because we're losing a lot of time and effort on those three or four months with someone who was learning the job, the ABCD about the job. So that's why uh, the minimum requirement that we keep is people with at least one to two years of experience working on that. And specifically into whatever role they have applied to. What happens is that, you know, if, for example, I am uh, aspiring to be an executive housekeeper. Right. All right. So when uh, when I come to the ships, uh, we do not hire exterior housekeepers directly. We always hire them as a, a supervisor of the floor supervisor. Mm -hmm. That's the lowest level that, uh, you know, in a supervisory level, we hire people. If not, then we attend, we have to hire them as, uh, as room attendants as such. Mm -hmm. uh, but then at the end of the day, if you join as a floor supervisor, we expect you to know A to Z about what it takes to run a room, okay? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. the reason why is you go as a supervisor, the room attendants who are there, they are technically super sound. They work there, they know about everything before you go there as supervisor. So now you go and stand in front of them to do a briefing. And if you don't know about what they're talking about, or they, they talk about a certain chemical, they talk about a certain cleaning agent, they talk about, you know, this certain kind of wood is broken, so we need to get this kind of things put back up, etc. I'm just saying, uh, examples I'm just putting out there. Uh, you would not be able to build that rapport with, the, with your own employees. So this is why uh, we generally hire people with experience who have been on the floor. They know how to deal with people. They know how to be, deal with, uh, with employees as well as the work that they are doing. Maybe restaurant, galley, galley. Uh, in kitchen because on ships, um, uh, they don't call it kitchen, they call it galley. So, okay. you know, that's the jargon I'm too used to right now. So sorry if I use the word galley again and again, but that's basically the kitchen effect, right? So uh, that's the opportunity. Uh, so that's why uh, we generally prefer uh, having employees who have experience when we hire them at all. Okay. So the, the first prerequisite generally for any application of jobs on shifts is the fact that you should have worked uh, before. Okay, you should know your job because we are not going to train you about mm -hmm. your job. We're going to train you about how to adapt to life on ship. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to train you how to cook, uh, how to serve or how to manage people. That's not what we're going to do because we don't have time for that. Okay, we have 6,000 guests uh, to be served every hour of the day. So you know the amount of pressure which every single employee is going through. Uh, 2,300 employees, each of them having a very specific role to accomplish. And then... Uh, somebody has to start doing our job and start training our job, uh, we're losing productivity. So that's how we look at every hour which is spent of uh, every single employee because we are responsible for every work and rest hour of an employee. You are required by law at Maritime that you need to take rest for 10 to 12 hours for sure. You have to. Okay, that is guaranteed. So if you are working on a ship, it is the responsibility of the HR manager that every single employee is recording how many hours of rest they get. So that's important for us because if you are not resting well, you will get fatigued and you cause accidents and which can cause the whole ship to sink. You know, that's how they see that. So uh, looking at one side is safety and the other side is productivity. Also. So that's why uh, they look at people who really know what they're talking about. But now you mentioned prerequisites. Let me tell you one of the top prerequisites in the, as you pass out of college is to prepare your next two years after you pass out, right? Now you've got a job to work on a hotel, in a, in a hotel or in any organization you chose. And then you make a decision to also look for a career at sea. Then you need to start working on some things right now. Okay, one definitely is getting a passport. Uh, two is mm -hmm. definitely having uh, what we call as an STCW course. Uh, this is uh, a requirement that you have to do this 14 day uh, course on safety and uh, timekeeping and uh, you know watch keeping 
the, the, the STCW stands for uh, this course, which very specifically trains you about simple things at sea. Okay, not that you just go there and you don't know what to do. So that's a course which is a mandatory requirement as per uh, Director General of Shipping from India, that every single person who is aspiring to go on ships need to go and do an STCW course, which is a 14-day full-time course. So you need to get, get that done. So once you get a job on ship and then you start looking for the STCW course, gets delayed, your recruitment process gets delayed. So a lot of times when it comes, I, uh, when people uh, say that it took, it took six months for me to get a job, in normal circumstances, if you have an STCW, it takes six months for you to get your visa, your medical, your, all that things done, it takes time. Even once you get your offer letter, okay, it takes time for the paperwork to complete. Mm -hmm. um, so get your STCW done. Uh, and then there is also, uh, that takes time. So while you're getting your experience, meanwhile, get that done. The second tip that I give a lot of people is that learn a foreign language, okay? Uh, I learned French, but that's culinary French, okay? Uh, and you ask me to speak to two people, Jean-Mapel, Ajit, and that's the end of what I can say about French, you know? That's what everybody <laughs> learns in college, <laughs> in hospitality. Right. But then yeah. after that, uh, you know, if you have a normal conversation, you get stuck. So what happens is, in the two years after you pass college, it is one of the good things that you can do is try and develop a very good foreign language. Okay, mm -hmm. because that would help you stand apart your competition when it comes to applying for jobs. Because again, like I said, job is not only limited to your college alone or your organization. Alone. Your competition is pan India. It is all over the world. Uh, I'll just give you an example for uh, the, sh the amount of uh, applications we get in our direct uh, website of Royal Caribbean would be at least seven to eight applications an hour. Okay. Uh, so you look at 24 hours because it's 24 hours. People apply from the world around the world. Okay. Right. Yeah. Data in somewhere right now. So uh, it's constantly applications flowing into different positions. So the comp what makes you stand out is these things. One thing is your technical knowledge. The second is your experience. The third is whether you have a foreign language because if you are an Indian and you can speak Spanish or you are an Indian, you can speak German or Italian or even French or any Asian language like Japanese or Mandarin, all these are key points. Okay, these helps you stand apart in your, in your resume uh, because that's the kind of people that come and cruise. The people around the world come and cruise. So if you are aspiring to be any front of the house department, like a guest service exception, uh, or uh, if you are interested in, in uh, F&B or uh, in, in, even in housekeeping, as a matter of fact, you deal with a lot of guests on a day-to-day -day basis. So a foreign language uh, push, puts you right on top of the list of people who can get hired fast. So I, I recommend this to a lot of people that you know your time that you build your experience on land uh, please ensure you learn a foreign language because uh, I personally have uh, promoted a lot of Indians uh, who go through interviews and I feel very proud about uh, when they come and sit in an interview and they're able to uh, perform by, uh, by their knowledge. But one thing which they lose is the fact that they don't have a foreign language. So because we're so used to speaking either Hindi and then our mother tongue, then English, and then we forget about that uh, foreign language because now you're in a foreign uh, work environment. So we expect you to learn that as well. Okay, so that could be another prerequisite I would generally put uh, for people to do. Okay, so yeah, so that's uh, majorly what I I would consider as things that people can work on right now to to build uh, towards the uh, time that they apply for a job. Uh, talking about, uh, this, thought about it is I spoke about the timeline. I tell you, the first time I applied for a job at sea in 2001, I applied back in April. Uh, in 2001 and by the time I actually came on the ship it was uh, November uh, when I actually joined the ship it took me six months to from from paperwork to get everything uh, done in terms of all the required uh, visa that is required again the mm -hmm. visa paperwork will only come if your medical is clear right yes so that you need to have a top uh, medical report because mm -hmm. again we are at sea when the ship is sailing Okay, so if you have any medical conditions which we cannot deal with, right. then we cannot sail. So what happens is we have to leave you back. So every single time that you come on the ship, people check your medical. 
uh, you have to be at good medical condition to be on board. Uh, so if you have some issues with your medical, then, you know, I'm sorry, but a career at sea generally is not uh, meant for you because you will not get proper care because we are at sea. It's not that we have, we have a clinic on the, in the ship, you know, there's a doctor, there are a few doctors and uh, nurses, but when it comes to um, a, a full-time hospital, we don't have that. So the medical condition of an employee is very important as well. So keep healthy. Very important. Ajit, yeah. uh, you know, that is such a, you know, great mammoth information, in fact, we have, because none of us were so much, you know, aware of what exactly is about the cruise liner, you know, getting into it. Now, I I'm certain that, you know, there are a lot of challenges also, a lot of professionals face, isn't it? Like, even for, say, for instance, our students are going ahead and they're starting the career and definitely they, most of them would be interested for this particular field. Now, what can be the challenge, you know, after they get selected, after they're on board? Uh, I'm, I'm certain that there would be quite a few and how do they exactly go ahead and have an overcome on that? Yeah. I would say the number one uh, challenge um, uh, before even getting on ships, I, I, I always see a lot of people who write to me uh, because they got scammed, okay? So working on ships, mm -hmm. the first thing you need to do, whenever you get an offer letter is authenticate whether the person or whoever sent you the job offer is an authenticated uh, agent, okay? And then uh, uh, you get scammed in between because they'll ask you for some money to go over there, et cetera. So please be careful about that. And that's, that's a challenge that I put across all the time and I remind people because people take advantage of this because people don't know uh, that there is a process to follow, et cetera. They send you an offer letter directly and tell you, hey, you know what, put in $200 and you're able to come and join us on this date and et cetera. So be careful about that. That's one challenge that I recommend uh, to look out for. Mm -hmm. Once uh, you have the opportunity, you've got the job, uh, well, the, the, the difficulties, the challenges I would put there is one is that you have a very little space to live out of, okay? So you have a very nice little cabin. Uh, you're given a, a good uh, room to live in. Sometimes you may have to share it, sometimes not depending on the management level that you join in. Uh, and when you share it with somebody, again, like I told you, uh, the cultures are different. Uh, the lifestyles are different. People generally face that challenge as well. One of the greatest challenges that they face is that, is uh, getting along with uh, other nationalities, like other people, uh, because that impacts your day-to-day -day life. Yeah. The, the second uh, challenge that I have seen is, uh, you know, when you work on land, everybody finishes their job and then they go home, okay? So there's nothing to do with the job anymore. You know, you leave and then people call you on the phone probably, but uh, you're out of that place. You know, for example, the hospital, you're out of that, the hotel, you're out of that uh, premises and that's the end of it. So don't think about it anymore. When it comes to ship, that's not the way. You leave your work, you go down to your uh, your public areas that is like a, we, we have a gym we have a lot of facilities crew messes bars everything available on the ship but yet you go there you see the same amount of people it's the same people that you see again so it's again the same people that you go back to work to so you know it's, it's you don't get that complete breakaway okay uh, and that sometimes is a challenge people don't people are like man give me a break just get out of my life but you can't do that you know a ship you, you, these are the people that you see again and again. That's what uh, it is, because that's the workspace that we have. That's the living space also that we have. So that's the kind of environment that you come back to. So some people find that a huge challenge as well. Okay, but that's being, and, and that amount of socializing we expect from people to adjust, respect the people and understand and work with them at that point of time. Um, another challenge, uh, again, it is not a challenge, but a lot of times people are not very comfortable sharing workplaces, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, taking uh, direct orders from people from different uh, cultures, uh, different uh, levels. Uh, when it comes to ships, it takes a lot of coordination. You need to be able to work with a lot of different uh, people and environments that you have worked with before. So uh, you're so used to doing things in a hotel and once you come uh, to ships, uh, they all tell you, they, the first thing they will tell you, if you tell, oh, I did this on the hotel, like the first thing they will tell you is, forget all that, okay? So it's got nothing, uh, you follow this. And, and I have had people come to my office, you know, after a couple of months, they come and say, you know what, 
I'm not able to take this. this is too much. You know what? I've I've learned so much and I've gained so much knowledge, but here I come and it becomes a zero knowledge for me. So, yes. Yeah, so then, uh, as long as you are open to learn new things, uh, you you have to come with a mindset of understanding that I need. Uh, there's a steep learning curve that I have to go through. Mm-hmm. Okay, the first few months, uh, there's so much things to learn and adjust and 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 be work. You have to be able to uh, open yourself to a lot of knowledge coming into you. A lot of people uh, get stuck in their past when they come on the ship, but unfortunately, that doesn't help because if you want to build a future on the ship, your first uh, is to open up and absorb and understand what it takes to be in that place at that at that time, okay, and adapt to that change, and that's critical for us. Uh, uh, another last challenge that I would put across, uh, generally faced by people, is uh, that there are no holidays. Okay, there is. There is no holiday at all. There is no Sunday, Monday, or Tuesday. There is every day is a work day. Okay. There is no PL, uh, and I don't even remember the terms. The cash, uh, casual leave, and uh, there is no leave there. There's no business called leave. Okay. You have uh, been given a contract, and you are expected to perform a job uh, every single day. Uh, you know, the best part is sometimes when people do take a sick leave. You know. The risk leave when you fall sick, you you get your leave. They get bored. They they just don't want to sit in the room. You know, you sit in the room and you you can sleep, but there's only so much you can sleep in there. Okay. So they get bored and they say, you know what, uh, we need to get back to work. Okay. So, but at the end of the day, yeah, the point coming is that we have contracts given for people to perform for that period of time. For example, it might be four or up to six or even eight months contracts people do. Uh, and that full stretch of time, you're supposed to work for 10 hours every day. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, sometimes it goes up to 11 or 12, but it depends on what kind of role you do. Like for me, it's 24 hours. You know, you, I am on call. I'm, at any point of time, anything happens, they need to let me know. I need to be aware about uh, whatever happens for the crew. But uh, a regular position is always given for 10 to 12 hours of uh, work hours only in a day. And right. so everybody works for that period of time for a period of six to eight months, right? So that's what uh, a work environment is like that. But then if you are used to a, you know what, it's Sunday, I need to take a break. Um, you know, unfortunately that doesn't work there. Uh, nobody gets a holiday. But something good is that every time we are at port, which is every other day, you have the freedom, you get a few hours because all the guests go out. Yes. Once the guest goes out, then, you know, you finish your work and you have all the time in the world to do whatever you want. You can go to see the world. Uh, you know, that's what I've done. I've, I think I have only have uh, Antarctica and the Arctic continent to go to. But apart from that, I have been to every other continent and every, I wouldn't say every other country, but yes, I have been to a lot of countries. Uh, you, you ensure that you finish your work, you get uh, three to four to five hours break go out, uh, see the place, and you come back, you get some fresh perspective, you meet new people, you meet a completely different culture. Okay. There's so many things which would go on at the same time. So yes. this gives us an opportunity to to freshen up and then you come back to work and then you're back to work again. So uh, it, it's a very fast-paced life. And uh, if you're not used to that fast-paced life, then it gets a little challenging. Uh, you know, you need to come with that mind frame that, you know what, the moment I start my job, I have... Uh, you know, when I start my contract until it ends, you have to work continuously. Mm-hmm. So that's a little challenging sometimes. Right. Ajit, uh, if I really want to be a part of the, you know, the line of cruise liners, and if I'm in year three, just like all our students here are, any particular, you know, you can say a choice of uh, specialization, which would be, in fact, uh, one of the most important. Uh, like, for instance, say, you know, it might be in the cruise liners, it's uh, mostly the kitchen department, which is mostly having recruitments, and we might not be having front office so much. So what, what is the popular, most popular departments that usually cruise liners recruit with? Okay, so... Uh... Frankly speaking, uh, I'm sorry, this is a huge topic. Okay, I can talk about this for hours together. Okay, but then I'm going to pick a few top three of them, I would say. Yes. Uh, I, I have a YouTube channel where I speak about each department. I break down and I speak about it. It's called The Sea is Calling You. Okay. Uh, and I recommend you, anybody who's really interested in a career at sea to right. watch that video, which I break down each department. Sure. And I say which position in that department is, is the entry level and what you like to apply for. But if I were to talk, pick the top three, 
uh, the number one would be definitely the galley, so the kitchen, mm -hmm. okay? And specifically there, uh, we are always looking for pastry, okay? Pastry chefs, okay. Uh, pastry cooks, uh, bakery right. cooks, bakery chefs. Uh, again, you might not, uh, we do not hire directly uh, freshers into that role because we, the, the workload is very high. Right. Uh, because you know, six thousand meals every period, uh, continuously. Okay, uh, and and this is what happens when uh, you know we have all these people trying to perform the job, uh, mm -hmm. and they don't know the job and they're not well versed what to do. Uh, you know, the pressure is built on the other people, so that gets a little challenging. So the experience right. is very important. So what I tell people is that if you are interested in the galley or in the kitchen, uh, then uh, right now once you pass college. Choose a profession like in pastry, for example, get two years of experience and, and real hardcore experience because mm -hmm. people who work there are super fast at what they do. So right. you go there and you start, you know, snailing around, mm -hmm. uh, you're not going to stay there for long. Okay. They are also one of the highly paid uh, positions. Uh, if, you, if you look at the position which they enter uh, as a pastry cook as such, you know, first okay. level as such. Uh, okay. you, uh, you start from, if a regular cooks get around $800 to $850, a pastry cook goes all the way to $950. It gets a $100 jump directly. Uh, the same thing happens with the pastry chef. The more higher you go into, the more uh, higher paid uh, is that role in the pastry as such. Mm -hmm. uh, the other position definitely that we look out is for f and food and beverage. Uh, in those two sections, one is uh, the service side and the other one is uh, the bar side. Mm -hmm. Beverage department is a huge department. It's, uh, you know, cruise lines uh, make a lot of revenue out of beverage, okay? Because people come to get drunk. So let's say yes. they, just want to, they just want to forget everything, have a drink uh, all through the day, go to right. sleep on the lounge, uh, get some sun. Uh, they come down and uh, party all night or, you know what, yes. enjoy some great shows which is happening. And they come and sit there. Uh, so the bar is a very critical aspect. Again, uh, most sought after position is the bartender or what we call as a bar server. Right. Uh, a lot of them from bartender, they uh, choose to uh, get promoted and become beverage managers. Mm -hmm. But uh, what I have personally seen is a lot of people who don't want to leave bartending because it's uh, it's fun. Uh, two is you're in the heart of the whole yes. uh, operation which is going on in the bartender. So Correct. that's one role which is very important. And you get highly tipped. So, uh, you know, people take home, uh, you know, so much salary that I don't even know because frankly speaking, because it's a, it's a personal thing. So you get a tip yes. from every guest. If you serve right. 100 guests in a day, a ten dollar, thousand dollar a day. You know, people make good money, big money there. So that's why they don't quit uh, the bartending job. So one of the most uh, sought after positions is the bartending job. So the competition is very high uh, when it comes to bartending and uh, even beverage uh, department and such, uh, because the consumption, the way of handling is very, very intricate, and we have inventories and you know every drop of liquor is important. So. Then you are going into becoming an FMB manager, or you want to become a beverage manager, a beverage supervisor to start with, for example. Uh, you need to be really on top of knowing what it takes to build a drink, what is your inventory, how much is consumed, et cetera, et cetera. So the expectation of that role is very high. So, yeah, beverage department, bartender is a good role. Uh, also, uh, the restaurant side. Now, my recommendation is uh, the two positions which uh, are entry level position easy to get into is one is the restaurant and the other is uh, you know, the the galley in the kitchen right, right. so right. as a cook so what happens is a lot of people get into the ship using those positions so if you are being on a uh, on land and you worked uh, you know as as whatever position that you are uh, they they apply for this role as a waiter and then they get into the position of waiter. And then they move, once they're on board, then my team uh, does a lot of career progression for them. They sit down and they, they sit down with each employee, uh, discuss their, their history, they look at what are their, their backgrounds, give them an opportunity to cross train right. during their free hours, and yes. then they build a career into that particular position. And that's where guest services come into play. Mm -hmm. uh, they do not hire people directly into guest services because we cannot have people on the desk who have no idea how the ship runs. Okay, a fresher 
it's not possible even if you worked on land as a guest services to get directly into guest services gets a little challenging 90 percent of our employees who are in guest services are internally promoted from either being a waiter or a bartender or a, what we call cook people who worked as cook gets promoted because they worked as a restaurant before they just came to become a cook and then jump and move into another role. Right. So that's what happens. A lot of times that happens. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do take people uh, who have experience in front office and have a foreign language and have worked as concierge. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, concierge yes. position is a sought after position and a butler position is what they call it. Okay. Um, that's also a very sought after position because it's uh, a good position to begin with. It's very personalized and we look at people mm -hmm. who are certified but uh, butlers uh, for our sweet guests and those guests are super premium guests uh, sometimes I myself cannot believe the amount of money they spend to come and cruise you know they a year of salary of mine is spent by them in a week just to come and cruise on a ship for seven days so that's the kind of people who come and cruise so the butler for them the butler program the concierge program for them is super classy and so then they, they, they hire people from outside directly uh, who have experience working in concierge or guest services and, and have, are able to speak a foreign language uh, because these guests come from all different parts of the world. So that helps. Ajit, what about housekeeping? How, uh, you know, like uh, how many people basically get an offer to go and, you know, and start a career in housekeeping in cruise liners? Oh, yeah, absolutely. For example, you look at my ship that I just came from, Symphony. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. housekeeping department has uh, 167 employees and 24 people in management. All right, so close to 180 people who are from one ship at one time. I'm talking about we have 25 ships. There are more than 150 ships around the world uh, who are flying right now uh, with all these opportunities which are there. <clears throat> so you'd look at housekeeping. Yes, housekeeping ha has a lot of opportunity. Like I said, uh, one is definitely uh, the the rooms division, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. The entry level for those positions is basically as a, a room cleaner, okay? And then you become a room attendant. A room attendant uh, becomes a supervisor. From supervisor, they go up. Uh, another entry level is the laundry. The laundry is uh, very much, uh, uh, I would say, monitored and controlled because uh, it's not the laundry that we do here. Uh, everything that comes out of the laundry has to bio, uh, you know, it has to be biodegradable. It, it, there's a lot of things that have to go through in running a laundry on ships. So that is a position which a lot of people get into. Uh, and finally, we have public area cleaners and public area upkeep. And all this comes under housekeeping. So uh, the, the, the entire operation uh, requires a lot of, uh, you know, area knowledge. Yes. So housekeeping as such, the, <clears throat> the reason why it is challenging for... Uh, for hotel management, I wouldn't put that in the top three, is because uh, you know people who pass out from hotel management generally do not prefer becoming room attendants. Okay, um, so uh, yeah, if you've done a one-year course, you generally like to go and become a room attendant. You don't mind becoming a room attendant, but when it comes to hotel management graduates uh, who have done their uh, hotel management, they generally do not prefer applying for uh, room attendance. But you know what? The, I would say the second high, second or third highly paid after a waiter, after a bartender is a room attendant. They get tip because you personally are talking to the guest every right. day. Every yes. seven days, the guest changes. So there's a new set of guests who comes every seven days. So you are personally one-on-one -on -one interacting with the guest. And, and uh, I'm not joking. There's a lot of money that they make. Okay. okay, but then uh, that's why a lot of them don't want to become managers also because once they become a manager, you don't earn even half or one fourth of what right. you earn as a room right. attendant. So right. um, uh, that's why I put it as a number four position mm -hmm. of housekeeping people who try to get on ships because if you're if you're comfortable becoming a room attendant and you want to grow that way, amazing. Yes. Okay, you can. That there is a huge amount of opportunities there. Okay. But then if you're looking at becoming a deck supervisor or what we call it as each each level is called a deck. Yes. Or what you call a floor supervisor. Uh, the hiring is uh, very, very difficult. Very, very, very tight, I say, you know, because uh, the the way uh, operations are in housekeeping here is completely different there uh, because housekeeping here is about uh, check in and check out on a daily basis, right? Uh, there's a certain amount of rooms you do first, then the rooms that you have guests staying, and then finally the empty rooms, and the various things, various formats that you follow. 
But when you look at housekeeping on ships, it's completely different because you have only one day in a week wherein you have uh, all the 6,000 guests to go and then you have 6,000 guests come in. So the, the, the entire, that one day of performance is, is driven by uh, the housekeeping department because that uh, the rooms have to be cleaned up, ready for the next 6,000 people who come in. So it's a little different operation. So when it comes to deck supervisors, uh, you know, you we do not see a lot of new people who come into that role. They're generally promoted within. But yes, from India, I've at least met at least three to four people who have uh, been hired directly as housekeeping supervisors. Okay. Um, and, and they do really good as well uh, because of their knowledge about housekeeping. Uh, and, and the time learning, the, the operations is what is lost, not the technical skills. As well. So yeah, housekeeping is good as well. Super. So that's a good knowledge and so many information, you know, we are in fact getting today. In fact, uh, there are quite a few questions which has come from our students. We were just okay. compiling to ask you. But then before that, I have a final question from my end, which I would like to put across to you. Uh, somebody going and spending, you know, his or her career in the ship and definitely having, say, about two years or some years of experience. Once I'm back, on the land, uh, what is the kind of designation I can start with, and you know what can be the approach in hotels? You know, mainly the acceptability among the land hotels out here. Okay, uh, my personal experience. I passed. Uh, I went on ships. I went as a bartender. I quit and I came back on land, um, and then I started applying for jobs on land. Right. Uh, the first thing that uh, they all hoteliers, uh, hotel HR managers who I met at that time told me, hey, you know what? I'm sorry, you're too qualified. Uh, you know, you worked uh, in such a big place and, you know, I, we will not be able to pay you the same amount of money and mm. etc." Yes. So first thing is, yes, if, if you decide to switch from ships to land, the first thing you need to understand is you need to take a big pay cut. Okay. Mm. So that mindset is ready. You should be ready to see what is the market offering on land. Okay. Yes. And for the for the role that you want to become. For example, if I was a deck supervisor or assistant housekeeper on, on a ship, and then I come to apply and I say, you know what, um, I'm getting married. I want to be with my family. I want to mm -hmm. go back on land. So you come in, you can, I would personally see that if you've been able to handle an assistant housekeeper position on a ship on land, you will be easily able to handle an exuberant housekeeper role because of the volume of operations that you handle is different, right? right? So the exposure that you get with handling people, the exposure that you get handling uh, the employees um, is, is different completely. And so you are uh, more resilient and more stronger when you come back and start working on land. So uh, uh, I personally believe it purely depends on how you sell yourself in the interview, mm -hmm. okay? Um, I, I would always see it as one step ahead. Uh, of what you position that you've done on ships that you can apply on land, okay? Because uh, that's the confidence levels that you build within yourself to handle operations when you come back on land. So I would say one step ahead of what position you are on ships is what you apply when you come on land. But uh, when it comes to applying on ships, it's not the same way. Uh, it's a little different. Uh, you may have to look at a step down from what position you're currently doing because they will always tell you that you know, what experience you have on the hotel is not what runs on ships because the operational integrities are different. So you will have to get used to it. So you may have to look at stepping down a position from what you are. And that becomes a challenge for a lot of people because they're so used to being, for example, uh, I'm an FME manager and you know, I don't want to step down and become a, yes. a restaurant manager or a major D or something like that. You know? So right. uh, a lot of people find it a little challenging there. Uh, and so that's why I recommend that if you're making a switch over into your career at sea, it should happen between the first few years of your career. Uh, because one, uh, you're still uh, single, hopefully. Yeah. So you have that, uh, you don't have that commitment back home to run back and, you know, you don't feel that uh, difficulty there. Second is because uh, you don't mind stepping down one or two career steps because uh, you, you're in an early stage of your career. Uh, and not see if you have already been 15 years working on land and then you apply for a job at sea, you may not get the same level. So I've seen a lot of people be disappointed and say, no, I don't want to take that role. I understand it. For me also, it would have been the same. So if you are looking at a career, make it in the first few years of your career to apply and get into ships and then and then build a career on ships because that, have, that is possible. I have seen people become my heart 
trail director who I worked with, he uh, recently, auto director, what we call a general manager, he started his career on ships as a cleaner. Okay. He started his career as a ship. In 15 years, he became the general manager. Uh, it, it's Being a general manager of a ship is, is way complex than just being here because you have so much things happening in your hand and you're looking yes. after all this. It's not easy. So being there from what you started from, because he joined the ships when he was 23 or something. And uh, he joined as a cleaner, stepped up, stepped up in housekeeping, become an executive housekeeper. From housekeeper, he jumped into guest services. Mm -hmm. And from guest services, he moved up to uh, rooms division. And then he became uh, a general manager. Uh, and, and you know what? He started at 23 and at 35 or 36, he, he became a general manager. Uh, right. you know, that, that's an amazing career path that people choose. So, you know, this is the right time for people once they pass out of college, look at the first two steps a couple of years or on land, get that experience and then um, jump into ships. And cruise line. That's great. Thank you so much. And uh, Ajit, now I'll be in fact going ahead and starting with the Q&A, uh, which in fact yes, the students please. have put across. So the first question from our student of IIHM would be, how different is it to work in a cruise kitchen than a hotel kitchen? Okay. The very first thing, there's no fire. Okay. So zero fire on ships. So you can't put a burner on and start cooking. The first thing that is makes a difference. There's no burner, there's no fire on a ship, zero fire on a ship. You don't have, uh, what I meant to say, there's no naked fire. So you cannot light uh, matches on a ship, okay? Right. So everything that is done there is on uh, induction pans, okay, uh, induction uh, heaters, and, and the heating is done through, through steamers and combi ovens and uh, the entire process of cooking. That's the first difference that you have. So if you're used to doing things which are slightly different here, or on ships, it's slightly different. So you generally have to be really careful about how uh, those, uh, like I said, the equipment used to tell changes completely. So you get used to a certain equipment and you come there and you're like, what the hell, man? This is so difficult. I don't know how to cook yes. without fire. So there's a lot of times that becomes a real challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, we try and avoid that completely. Uh, apart from that, uh, the, the difficulty, uh, the difference in, in galley is, I would say, uh, very strict safety rules. When mm -hmm. it comes to how you use your equipment, there is a kitchen, there's a nice training which is done uh, okay. from specific ways that you use it. There's a, a particular uh, standard when it comes to that. You need to pass that to start using knives on a ship. Even though you right. worked before using yes. knives, etc. this is what you need to do first to pass this. Uh, yeah. Which might seem lame, but in the end of the day, that's the requirements that they have on, on ships uh, when it comes to galley. Um, uh, apart from that, overall, um, the, the, I would say that the defining difference is that we call it as food production and we don't call it as uh, kitchen because of the fact that uh, the production unit that we have there is huge. Like I told you, 6,000 meals a day, okay? Mm -hmm. You have six pastry chefs, I'm just saying, okay? Or you have five chefs who are specializing in a particular meal. Uh, so the, the, the production level is very high. You know, the, the movement of production is very high. So things are built, are already set. There's an SOP, there is a recipe. You need to follow that as a, as a whole. Innovative cooking that you might be able to do uh, is not very common there. Okay, until unless you are in a specialized kitchen, like specialty kitchen. We have specialized uh, specialty restaurants and those kitchens for those specialized uh, restaurants might have the opportunity. But when it comes to production, then it's, it's majorly into ensuring following SOPs on a day-to-day -day basis and dishing out uh, around about 300 plates in a minute. Uh, that's what happens, pump, pump, pump. That's the way they look at it. So yes, it's similar to what happens on land, but uh, the high R and a low R is there. The high R is what you have to get used to. Wonderful. Uh, I'll be having the next uh, question, Ajit, and this would be, in fact, uh, this is in relation to how to approach, you know, the recruitment agencies for recruiting. Like, this is soon after they are freshers, you know, they're completing the course. So since you also mentioned about a lot of, you know, agencies who are not really right and they can, students can really get into trouble. So if Correct. you can basically tell about the entire procedure of, you know, recruitment for them. Uh, I would say there are two... Uh majorly two ways of entering a ship. Number one mm -hmm. is directly through the company's website. Okay. okay. Every company has a, a website uh, on career options. For example, take Royal Caribbean as such. Royal Caribbean is a company which has a careers at sea. There is a, 
uh, a website you go there you put in your application uh, you highlight what are the things that you are um, you know specialized in etc and then there is an application process uh, the back end of that is handled by us wherein we look at every position uh, keywords uh, highlighted we take those roles up and we look at those positions each one by one so uh, and then there, there's an interview done the interview is done by the office or by the local hiring agent we have an office in india okay uh, which is based out of mumbai and uh, they also do certain uh, they they help a lot in all the paperwork from your hire okay so that same thing is done by carnival cruise lines norwegian cruise lines doesn't have an office here but they do have an online option and right. then a lot of people apply directly through them so this is the safest one wherein you apply directly through their website and then you apply uh, you know go ahead and make applications there the second one is local hiring agent now various uh, ways of doing this online uh, there are various websites that you need to register for uh, and i would recommend uh, various uh, there is one called cruisecareers.in uh, there is also airborne cruises uh, there is indus uh, uh, cruise line comp uh, school i think okay. where you you finish your graduation in hotel management then you go and do a a uh, six month course or a one year course with them and they they place you into ships directly they work okay. with carnival again yeah. uh there is also yeah uh, i told you about hiren international that's another brand as well of mm -hmm. uh, local hiring agents mm -hmm. uh and then of the day uh, they keep advertising again uh, like i said the, the best way to know scammers is the fact that if you if they give you an offer letter without completing an interview okay and the interview needs to be done uh you know with uh, an agent either here or in uh, where of the company is from all right so uh, please be careful if you they extend you a, a written interview don't accept that uh, tell them thank you very much that's not the way it is um, or they they always do a face to face they just don't hire people left right and okay yeah. they need to see the people and they need to talk to them understand if they can communicate in the language that they prefer like i said there might be different foreign languages including english so that that communication conversation does happen for them okay the reason being also that's a safety reason now if you don't understand english or the language which they want uh, like german uh, when they make safety announcements on the ship if you don't understand their language then you're yes. stuck you know you you, are, you can become a club so okay. that's why the language is key over there so they will do this one on one interview and see if skype interview or something like that mm. to see if sure. you are uh, genuinely able to speak the language and able to communicate well with them Right, Ajit. I have a final question before we end today's session because yes. the the clock's really been fast. I mean, time just flies. You know, it's been such an interesting conversation with you. We've learned so Thank much. You. Just like I'm keeping on saying this. So, Ajit, this question is very interesting. This is uh, basically one of our students asking: If we are on ship for nine months and on land for three months, will this be still counted as one year of work experience? Oh no, no, no. Uh, no, uh, you, if you're on land for three months and then you apply, uh, I personally don't think it will work. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't work. You, you need to finish. For example, uh, again, I say this. Uh, uh, two points. One, uh, a lot of things. The brand you choose to work for. Okay. I personally, if you ask me, I would recommend that you, if you want to build a career at sea, you'd rather be a cook. in uh, uh at a brand which is known internationally okay than being an fmb manager in a, a in an indian brand for example you know a local brand or a hotel which is a paisa hotel in india you know i was surprised when i spoke about taj and obroy and nobody knew anything about that when i started working on ships they were, they were like yeah yeah good good but i know they didn't understand which brand i'm talking about okay so i had to at that point of time because trident was affiliated with hilton i always kept saying hilt okay so people get connected with me okay uh, so what happens is if you're looking at an international market if you want to build a career at sea again um, please don't get me wrong uh, these are amazing brands i work with the obroys and i know the taj as well both are amazing companies to work for uh, but if you want to make an impact in the international market uh, it will be very important that uh, you look for the brand that you work and build your experience with like i said if you are a pastry cook or even a pantry cook or a regular cook or uh, in fmb uh, whichever position housekeeping 
whichever role that you choose, choose the brand very carefully that you work for, because in the end of the day, that would identify you or make you stand apart when you apply for positions. As well. Okay, so this is my uh, uh, piece of advice when it comes to applying. And like I said, one year of experience, great. Uh, you know, your the fact is, for example, let me tell you, if we are looking for, pay, uh, for, uh, for example, waiters, all right, uh, a person who's applied to us who has worked for three years and uh, is from Philippines, okay, I'm just saying, okay, has worked for three years, and I get somebody who's from India who's applied and who's worked for one year, you will always go for the three-year person who's worked from Philippines because he's worked for three years, right? So suddenly your competition uh, is somebody who has got more experience, okay? Uh, but then if you have, if you're, that is applying for a position of a, a waiter, but at the same time, if you're applying a position of a attendant uh, and you have one year experience, uh, we would, uh, it doesn't matter which part of the world you are, we would take you uh, because you are an attendant position as such. So experience uh, very much comes to the role of that you're applying for also. Okay, great. Okay. Think... And, and like I said, this, I can keep talking about this because there's a huge amount of opportunities there and this continues to be happening. Uh, like I said, on YouTube, uh, I have a complete channel called The Sea is Calling You. Yeah, and I'm, I'm constantly putting their videos one by one about various opportunities. And you can listen to that uh, and understand where that department you want to make a career in. Again, the websites you need to apply in, that's the video I'm working on. So uh, it, it would be great that you guys can listen to that. And uh, I'll be happy to come and uh, give some more guys uh, it would have been great if I was in Bangalore and come and meet you all in person, but I think this is uh, great also that I'm able to speak to you guys. Yes, yes, absolutely, Ajit. I think this was fantastic. It's a great insight into this very new vertical for all our students. And in fact, our students would also be very, very interested to know your YouTube channel. If you can just let us know and just spell it out, maybe it will be great. They can all go and subscribe and follow you. Uh, uh, can I put it in the chat, please? Or... Yes, yes, that will be great. It the C is calling you. Okay, so that's my channel. Uh, the C is calling you, uh, and I would really appreciate uh, everybody who is interested in this can uh, subscribe and uh, listen to my videos. It would be nice. Uh, again. Frankly speaking, I don't know how long I'll be able to do this. The moment they call me back on ships, you know what? I, I, I don't get the time to spare to to, yes. to this conversation and videos. Yes. But right now I do have it. So I'm just making the maximum of the time that I Lovely. have right now. To, to put this across all right no no i'm very certain ajit that you know all our students everybody has heard you because it's not just in the zoom but then as you know this has been live streamed telecasted on the facebook channel of ours as well oh yes yes IH he told page. me yes that's what told yes. me about it you know so a lot of our students have been watching you there as well and i'm very certain that they would also be having loads of questions to put across to you so they will all be following you here and i shall be also going ahead and putting across to my other rest of my other campus directors as well so that in case if students have any further questions, they can always reach you and check out on your YouTube channel. Absolutely, it will be a pleasure, absolutely. Like I said, again, at, uh, I always put this there, again, in the YouTube channel, there's, there's an email address and at any yes. point of time, if they feel that they have been scammed or there is something sure. like that, tell sure. them to write to me with their offer letters and I can always tell yeah. them if it's real or not. You know, I do yeah. get that very often. So uh, please don't hesitate to contact me. I'll be happy to do that. Thank you so much from my entire team of IHM Bangalore and also IHM Pan India and our chairman, Dr. Bose. We are very, very happy to have you here in the career thank studio you. of IHM today. And thank you so much for all your time. And we wish you, of course, to stay healthy with your family and, of course, a trip back to Miami again. Yeah, yeah looking forward to that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Everybody. All the very best to you. Thank you very thank much. You. Yes. Thank you, Sanjay. Thank you so much.